Hi, I'm Rich Willey. I'm a running injury researcher at the University of Montana, uh, and I'm excited to be here for a return appearance on the Expert Edition. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back or welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show brought to you by Physiocram and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. As per the intro, the aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best performance. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen fields. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the highs, the lows, and the learnings of the featured guests. And we do that through featured performer interviews, expert editions, coaches' corners, and interest editions. And this week, you are in for a treat with return guest, Dr. Rich Willey, featuring on an expert edition. And today's topic and theme is all about the master's runner. What do we quantify as a master's runner? Well, really, anyone you could say from the age of 30 onwards could classify, but if you want to put the strict definition as the age of 40 onwards. Now, if you are not a runner and if you are not greater than 40 years of age, don't tune out. There's so much In this episode, that will be of great use to keeping you active across the lifespan, so don't tune out whatever you do. Now, on today's episode, Dr. Rich Willey, physiotherapist and also running researcher based out of the University of Missoula in the US, answers most of the questions you'd ever want answered around aging well as a runner. On this episode, Rich shares around why it is that we slow down as we age. He shares around the principles that underpin the changes that we see, why our tendons tend to lose stiffness as we age, what happens to our calves as propulsive elements as we mature as runners, why strength training is such a critical component of the aging runners training program, how to structure strength training around the week's running volume, rich answers the age-old question, is running bad for our knees? Rich explains why fast walking pace can be correlated with great longevity in life. And Rich touches on the role of footwear and shoe selection for the aging or master's runner. So you're going to really want a pen and paper, and I know you're going to want to share this around amongst your running friends or anyone that you know who is into running. Now, stay tuned at the end of the show because we will be drawing the On Running Shoes two-pair giveaway from episode 130 where we featured three times British Olympic triathlete and current Ironman world record holder, Tim Don's remarkable comeback story from his C2 neck fracture. So be sure to stay tuned until the end of the episode to find out if you were one of the two lucky winners of the On Running Shoe giveaway from episode 130. But for now, let's jump in with Dr. Rich Willey, US-based physical therapist and running researcher from the University of Missoula, sharing around all things on how to keep the masters running, running fast, and enjoying injury-free running. Dr. Rich Willey, welcome back to the Physical Performance Show. And we last caught up way back for an expert edition on episode 74. And uh, due to popular demand, we thought we'd better get you back 
back in the booth, so to speak, to uh, share around your knowledge of all things Masters-related running. So welcome back, Rich. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brad. It's it's wonderful being here, and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat, and um, I'm excited to talk about some running injuries. Rich, let's start with this big topic. It's certainly something I see a lot in practice, you know, with my day-to-day, and that's the Masters runner. And so, if we can purpose that whole conversation, a whole conversation today around the Masters runner. Firstly, what would you categorize as a Masters runner? Is there an age threshold, or does it start, you know, at a certain point in life? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of it depends on, you know, what what the context is. Some um, elite level competitions consider the Masters athlete to be above the age of thirty five, um, but I think for the for the average runner. Uh, I think most of us would consider the Masters athlete to be above the age of 40. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good uh, d- definition there, and it's certainly one I, I abide by. I'm still south of 40, Richard, so I'm happy to be classified as a young runner. <laughs> oh, I'm, 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 I'm on the other side, which is, I guess, I'm, I'm 45 now, which I'm not quite sure how that happened, but... Um, but for me, it's uh, it, it's given me some some motivation to try to understand running related injuries and you know running performance in the Masters athlete a little bit, so I can apply it to myself. Uh, certainly, and to give some context, Rich, for your day to day, you're still actively you know I really like that about your practice and your work. You're a proponent of what you preach, and that's you know you're out there running yourself. Just put us a little bit in perspective of your life at the moment, because when we spoke last time, you were uh, you've since transferred university. So what's life? Looking like for Rich Willie at the moment? Yeah, so I live in Missoula, Montana in the United States. And uh, Missoula is, uh, I would say it's an endurance sports mecca uh, for sure. Uh, there's no shortage of, of endurance runners uh, and cyclists and and uh, like ultra running is a really big sport here. We have some uh, very high caliber uh, ultra marathon athletes uh, who live here in town. And we've got some, uh, we've got a sky running uh, race uh, which is a, a global series, uh, and it, it's kind of just as it sounds. It's a, a race like ultra marathons that kind of really emphasize a high vertical gain, uh, and that's at a big ski resort a couple hours from here. But a lot of um, the race directors based out of Missoula and so forth. So, so there's a real big following for ultra endurance running here, or ultra marathoning, and uh, for me, that's such a fun group to work with because um, when when those athletes come in and and see us, they kind of in my mind are always kind of redefining what I consider to be reasonable or, <laughs> or doable, you know, across the lifespan, you know, and, and, uh, they, they make it, they make it look quite easy. And, and I, I think that the way ultra marathoners kind of train, I think it's a good lesson that we can take, you know, away as, as clinicians that, you know, if you build up to stuff slowly, um, you know, the human body is really capable of, of quite a lot of workload. Yeah. Great. And Rich, uh, professionally, what are you working on at the moment? Paper wise, research wise, what are the top projects you've got on your desk? Yeah. So I have, I have two lines. Of, of research. Um, the first one I do is uh, I work a lot with tactical athletes, um, which I would consider to be um, you know, m- uh, members of, of the military uh, and also wildland firefighters. Um, here in uh, Missoula, Montana, there's a big wildland firefighting base um, that's uh, is, that's based near here. And um, so for us, that that's a that's a big focus, <clears throat> and so it's, it's a big area of where I'm trying to pursue some some federal funding for for support for the research agenda that we have here. Um, the other, the other line I have is looking at running related injuries. And I should say that a lot of injuries that, uh, tactical athletes get. So, um, runners also get those, uh, so stress fractures and, and, uh, overuse injuries of the knee, Achilles tendon injuries, um, as well. So, um, within running related injuries, I kind of look a lot at, uh, patellofemoral pain. I also look at um, some Achilles tendon injuries, uh, and uh, now that I'm kind of starting to shift some of my research agenda towards looking at the older runner, I'm starting to look at a lot of the injuries that uh, uh, older runners tend to get. Which, which, you know, if you look at the literature, they they tend to be a little bit different than what you know your your average 22 year old college student might get. Well, let's go there, Rich. That's a it's a great segue. What uh, what injuries do we tend to see what, for masters runners uh, as opposed to non-masters runners or we'll just go with younger runners yeah sure so um so for the you know younger runner or the non-masters runner the the, the typical injuries that you're going to see with them and a lot of it depends on which which paper that you know you might read um you know they tend to be either patellofemoral pain or anterior knee pain 
So a lot of people also call that runner's runner's knee um, and uh, shin splints, also known as medial tibial stress syndrome. Uh, and th- those tend to be the, the types of injuries that, that you see more often with, with younger runners. Um, but some, something really interesting happens uh, in the master's athlete and they, their injuries uh, tend to shift. And, and if you notice, the injuries that younger runners get, they tend to involve uh, bony injuries or articular joint injuries. Um, but the master's runner, they tend to get many more soft tissue injuries. Uh, and so that would include you know, muscle and, and tendon and and so forth. And so their injuries tend to focus more on the calf musculature, the uh, Achilles tendon, and the plantar fascia. So plantar fasciopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, calf strains are are the injuries that you're going to see a lot in masters runners. There's also a little bit of difference in the injury rates too. Masters runners, uh, they tend to get injured a little bit more, uh, and and within a given year, um, they also tend to experience more multiple injuries uh, than than the younger runner. And that's that's really not too surprising when you think about it because um, the number one best predictor of whether or not you're going to get an injury is if you've had that injury in the past. And if you're a master's runner, you've probably been running for more years. And so you've kind of collected in your past history, a a bigger repertoire of of previous injuries. So um, I think just by just by virtue of your running history, you're going to be a little bit more prone to, to, you know, to certain injuries. And so, Rich, uh, you know, the distribution of injuries does change, as you've outlined there, that there's a greater risk of injury in a given year and, and uh, multiple injuries as well. If we sort of, that sort of uh, could paint a fair, fairly uh, depressing landscape, I guess, for a, a <laughs> master's runner listening in, right? However, uh, going back, what are the reasons why people should aim and aspire to, to continue to run through their decades into the master's years, Rich? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's easy to kind of get focused on the, you know, the, the little, and it's, it, and I should say, it, it's just a, a small difference in a greater injury rate in the master's runner. It's, you know, basically looking at on on average when you look across studies, the, the younger athlete tends to get uh, about 45% of all younger runners get injured on an annual basis, and that that bumps up just a little bit. It just bumps up to about 50% in the master's athlete. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth keeping just the. The, that change rate uh, in mind, but there are a lot of really good reasons. I mean, you know, running is, you know, when you look at the masters athlete and, and running in particular, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of individuals who are scientists who, who study, you know, healthy aging, they kind of uh, say that the ideal uh, aging model is, is the masters runner. Um, and, you know, so even when you look at, you know, like an older runner or a master's runner, and you compare them to the non-runner uh, who's of the same age, um, the metabolic cost of walking for for that master's runner is is going to be less than the non-runner um, walking at the same speed. So if you're if you're a runner and um, or maybe you're you're not a runner uh, and you're walking with someone you know who isn't a runner, if if you're that runner and your your walking companion is a non-runner, chances are you're walking at a lower metabolic cost. I mean, it doesn't take as much energy um, for you to walk at a certain speed. So there are a lot of just you know regular benefits that carry over uh, to just our our overall kind of movement health, if you will. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I think that the, you know, running is such a great way to kind of reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease and, and some of the other, um, kind of more metabolic issues that, you know, tend to pop up as we get a little bit older. Yeah, certainly. And there's been, you know, literature published that have looked at, you know, uh, the reduced, rates of cardiovascular incidents for runners versus non-runners so uh, you know all things aside uh, the cardiovascular benefits are enormous yeah absolutely i mean i mean for sure and and you know and that that's going to you know reflect also to you know your your preferred walking speed also so that also will be a little bit higher in the endurance runner and and that and that we know as we get older uh is uh and it, when i'm when I'm older is above the age of 65 your your preferred walking speed um is coming out as a as a somewhat strong predictor of of um of mortality um so faster walkers tend to tend to live a little bit longer 
Well, that might mean uh, I think I walk pretty fast, uh, so I'm, I might live forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, obviously there's, there's, some, there's a finite limit to that, but yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and, and it's worth saying that that relationship doesn't seem to really kick in until, you know, until you get, you know, above the age of 65. But, um, but yeah, so, I mean, I think that, you know, I think those things can be, you know, I think that's an easy uh, sell, if yeah. you ask me, for for maintaining a you know healthy and active lifestyle, um, it's not possible for everyone, of course. Um, but you know, if you are running, I, I think it's it, there, and you're doing great, um, fantastic. Keep doing it. If you're if you're getting a little bit older and you're you're starting to have some some more running niggles, um, you know, hopefully today we'll kind of talk about some things that you might be able to do to kind of head those off and and uh, when when to go seek care from a medical practitioner and so forth. Absolutely, and I think. Uh you know, listen, a question uh, came up, Rich, around from Shannon O'Hara. I think this is a good time to pop it in. So we've spoken about the benefits, but then there's there's typically the naysayers or the people that just discourage people to run into their later years, citing concerns around the good old, you know, running will wear out your joints, it'll wear out your knees. So what would you say from your research perspective to counter that myth? Yeah, I mean, so I haven't done any work in this area, but but others have, and and it, it, there doesn't seem to be really any relationship between uh, you know lifelong endurance running and your risk of developing knee osteoarthritis. And um, so, you know, in fact, you can even take that a little bit further, and that there have been some newer studies that have come out uh, that are strongly suggesting that runners who participate in a moderate amount of running. Uh, tend to have a lower risk of knee osteoarthritis than sedentary individuals. And um, so so I think that that makes sense when you think about it because, you know, uh, articular cartilage um, requires kind of systematic kind of rhythmic loading um, for nutrition because the, the way nutrition gets from the joint environment into your articular cartilage is more from a uh, this kind of uh, cyclic loading that you were going to see more so with running. And so, car, you know, cartilage is going to stay healthy when it's being loaded in that manner. Um, and then the other things, the other benefits of running are, you know, your overall inflammation is going to be lower um, and your um, body mass is probably going to be a little bit lower. Uh, your muscular qualities as well as, well as your other uh, connective tissue qualities, tendon and so forth, um, are also going to be uh, are, going, are going to be healthier. And so when, when you put all that stuff together, you're talking about, um, you know, articular cartilage likes to be used. And, and when you're doing something um, kind of very rhythmic like running, um, that's kind of what it's, that's really what, it, what it's designed to do. There's also a loading uh, component to it too. Uh, when when you look at when you compare running with walking, uh, when you look at the the amount of knee load per unit of distance. So let's say you go for a run and you're going to run one kilometer and you're going to walk one kilometer. The total amount of load on your knees is pretty much about the same um, between running one kilometer and walking one kilometer. And that's because when you're running, you're spending a lot of time in the air and your foot's not on the ground as long either. Whereas with walking, your your stance time or the amount of time you're you're loading your 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 lower extremities it tends to be a little bit longer. Um, you know, in fact it's about you know two and a half times as long as what it would be during during running. So um, so the overall load doesn't seem to be really a whole lot different when we compare endurance pace running and, and just walking. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think when you're looking at the, the perceived risk of knee osteoarthritis, um, there, that link doesn't really seem to be there uh, when it comes to, uh, comes to running. There, there are some caveats to that too that I think are worth adding, and that's that when we look at the elite runner, so, and, and we're talking like very elite and, and, and high, high volume runner, um, there, there's kind of, there seems to be a little higher risk of developing knee osteoarthritis in, in those individuals, the runners who are, are running at a very high level. Um, and that, but that doesn't really start kind of showing up until, until later on in life. And what do you put that increased risk in the elite runner down to, Rich? Gosh, that, that's a, that's a really good question. I think, I think the, you know, the elite runner is going to, you know, it, it, I think their workload. I think when we, if you compare that person to like a, like the recreational runner, um, the elite runner may not have as much control 
over their workload, meaning they might be coached by someone, they might be on a team. Um, so they may have to um, get out there and get it done on days when maybe maybe they've got some aches and pains, whereas maybe the recreational runner, um, because they're not held to that kind of that external and I guess standard, I guess you will, um, that maybe maybe they're able to kind of be smart and back off when they're not feeling quite as good. Um, you know, like outside of that, I mean, it's really it's really hard to say, like what are what are the reasons? But there, there does kind of seem to be like this little Goldilocks zone, if you will, that seems to be that you know moderate running just seems to be that that nice sweet spot, and and it seems to definitely lower your risk and. And uh, I would say maybe necess- not necessarily that more is, is, is better, but um, certainly running is, is better than not running. Even if, even if you are a recreationally competitive runner or an elite runner, it's, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. Rich, uh, if, we, if we talk about the effects of aging beyond injuries as we run into our later years, what are the effects? I mean, obviously we all recognize that we tend to get slower, but why is that? Yeah, so when when you look at when you compare the older runner to the younger runner, uh, um, there, there's some real distinctive changes in someone's running gait that's going to occur. Um, and you mentioned already, you, you tend to slow down a little bit, so your your overall your running pace tends to tends to decline slightly. Uh, also, your top end running speed tends to decline as well. And um, there's some really interesting uh, reasons for that. Um, first off, when, when you look at your VO2 max, um, so which is the the, the the max amount of oxygen that you can consume when you're you know at your peak um, workload, uh, that that tends to decline quite linearly with age, and and that's a, that's a hard thing to kind of kind of turn around. Um, and you know that that's not really my, my area of background. My area of background is more in biomechanics and and and, and injuries and so forth. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, you know some things happen that are kind of a regular occurrence with aging, and one of those is that we tend to lose muscle mass and um you know that process is called sarcopenia um and so sarcopenia is something that happens to all of us um and we you know not only do we we lose muscle mass um our we tend to get more fatty infiltration into the muscle so the muscle quality is not quite as good um the cross-sectional area becomes a little bit less as well um, we also have a reduce in, a reduction in the neural drive. So um, there seems to be a real uh, neural component to the amount of force that um, the, the muscle can generate as we get older. Uh, and, and that's an important thing to think about, too. It's not just the muscle's fault. The, the nervous system has, has, has a role here, even though there's a very, very tight linkage between the nervous system and our, and our muscles. Um, so, so there's that aspect, and, and when, when we look at it, where we tend to see the greatest decline in muscle force production is in our plantar flexors or our calf musculature, um, and and that has an important consequence for the way we run because um, the calf musculature is the is the largest contributor to. Uh, the propulsive ground reaction force. So how much we're pushing off and when we're trying to push forward. Um, and, it, you know, as a result, be, because our calf musculature is not generating as much muscle force uh, when we're running, our step length tends to decrease too. So we don't, we tend to kind of take a little bit more of a, like a shorter step um, as we age. Uh, and um, so as a result, we tend to kind of have a little bit of a higher cadence uh, in the older runner. Um, they tend not to push off again, as much as I mentioned earlier, from from their calf musculature, from their ankles. Uh, and um, they over time, they'll start to develop a little bit more of a shuffling uh, type, type gait uh, pattern. And um, there's some other things that happen too, you know, that um, – or we we don't tend to a lot of times we you know we think about stiffness we think about it as being you know kind of a bad thing um, or you know layperson may but really running stiffness is really important or leg stiffness is really important and and that basically if you can kind of imagine your your lower leg as or your whole leg as being like this this giant spring and um, your your leg that leg spring becomes less tight. Are less springy as we age as well, and um, having a nice springy, you know, lower extremity is a good thing because that means we're going to store and release energy a lot 
more efficiently when we're running. And um, when when a runner is uh, aging, we, we tend to lose that leg stiffness. And one of the biggest reasons for that is we tend to have our, our Achilles tendon in particular becomes uh, less stiff. And um, so we, we also tend to lose not just some muscular qualities, but we also tend to have um, some some loss of tendon stiffness, which is is uh, generally thought to be a, a very desirable trait uh, in, in a tendon, particularly one that is, is being asked to store and release energy uh, very efficiently. Yeah, so, I mean, th- there are the very real changes, as you mentioned, VO2 max, sarcopenia, less, you know, muscle size, uh, dynapia, dynap- which is a new term, rich, that neural drive reduction. And, and then as, as you've, you've counted there, reduced stiffness in tendons. And at the recent Latrobe running symposium, you put a beautiful slide up, which with your permission, we might uh, pop up uh, in the show notes, which was the slide that was titled, Plantar Flexors Take the Biggest Hit. And it was just a nice graphical depiction of the young versus masters runner and that reduced calf, calf size. And, you know, the, the bottom of that slide, Rich, is loss of propulsive force minus 13% step step length by the age of 60. So it's it's a very real reduction, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and and I should say that's from the age of 35 to the age of 60. We lose about 13% of our of our step length when we're running. That's some, some really, really great data that um, is coming out of um, Steve Messier and, and Paul DeVita's work. Uh, this was published a, about a year ago. Um, but yeah, when you know when when you look at that, I mean, that, it's really being driven by it, it's the plantar flexors, the calf muscles are that's that's really driving all that, and that seems to be that that plantar flexor push off that power is um, is the biggest contributor to that loss of of step length for sure. And if you're not taking as long of a step, I mean, uh, that's going to be you know unless you're increasing your your cadence more so to take take you know to to, to take that into account um you're gonna you're gonna start slowing down yeah and i mean and i think you share the the terminology or the phrase at the running symposium around that's why you know that that shuffling gate you know you do tend to see the the masters runner the more mature runner tend to almost look like they've got some suction caps on their feet as opposed to the 20 year old runner that sort of sort of bounds along down the road mm-hmm. yeah exactly so like you know if you have someone so we're basically running it's very similar to single leg hopping and um you know if you can imagine kind of single leg hop so just standing on one leg and jumping up and down and stuff like that the faster you can get off the ground and the less time you're going to spend with your foot on the ground the the stiffer that leg spring is going to be and it and that carries over and from a conceptual standpoint very well to running and so the faster you can get that foot off the ground the the greater leg stiffness you're going to have and 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 high, having higher leg stiffness uh, is generally thought to be a, a very desirable trait, um, and it carries over to some running injuries too. And, and the big one being um, Achilles tendinopathy. We see reduced leg stiffness in individuals who have uh, Achilles tendinopathy. So, uh, and we also see reduced leg stiffness in older runners. And not surprisingly, the older runner is, uh, particularly the older male runner, is going to be the person who's going to be at the greatest risk for developing Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, and, and that's because their their plantar flexors and their, their tendon kind of loses the capacity, or lose not loses the capacity, but loses some capacity um, for, for high training loads. Um, and, and typically those training loads are not going to come necessarily from running a lot of volume, but more so from, from running fast and, and, and running up and running up hills in particular. You're listening to Dr. Rich Willie sharing around all things, the master's runner on this, the expert edition of the physical performance show. Support for today's show comes from Physio Creme. Physio Creme is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients, ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, then you'll be happy to know that Physio Creme does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates. It is clean to use and pleasant smelling, with the smell fading away in just minutes. Its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind, and Physiogram can be found in chemists and health foods. Physiogram can be found at chemists and health stores Australia-wide, as well as their online shop. They've even offered a 20% discount to listeners of the Physica Performance Show using the coupon code POGO. That's P-O-G-O. 
simply when you shop at the Physiocram store. That's physiocram.com.au, spelled F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M.com.au. Hurt in sucks and Physiocram have you back. Support for today's show is also lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete rehabilitation, get back to your physical best, and in doing so, cross your physio finish line. That's where we high five you and celebrate the fact that you are back to your physical best. In addition to traditional session-to-session appointments, we offer some industry-first models of care, including our unique 2, 6, and 12-week fixed-feet unlimited access finish line programs and our very popular monthly wellness booster packs, which include physiotherapy, remedial massage therapy, exercise rehabilitation, including clinical Pilates, and exercise physiology and use of state-of-the-art equipment such as the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill, all from a low $195 per month health fund rebatable. To find out more about Pogo Physio, jump over to pogophysio.com.au and schedule your one-hour initial appointment. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Rich Willie sharing around all things keeping the Masters runner running fast and injury-free. So, Rich, uh, before we look at how some of these age-related declines can be minimised or, you know, slowed, if you like, potentially, can we just explore this, you know, it's a bit of a a lead-in to exploring the running injuries of Masters uh, in more detail as well, but, you know, this concept of a seesaw, if you like, with regards to running injuries, and, you know, it's a nice visual for people that we want to try and balance the seesaw and... My own interpretation of the work that you presented at La Trobe University there was, you know, it's almost like we've got loading on one side and our body's ability to deal with the load on another or the capacity. And so can you put a a few uh, ideas around that concept? What are we trying to do at a very basic conceptual level to try and minimize running injuries, whether a master's athlete or a a younger runner? Yeah, so I I think that, you know, when when you when you're talking about that kind of seesaw, you're basically talking about load capacity. And, um, so as you mentioned on one side of that seesaw is going to be like, you know, the, the, the person's ability to tolerate training loads. Uh, and and, uh, there's going to be a lot that's going to go into that at the very local level. It's going to be tissue qualities, um, things like, you know, like how strong your muscle is and how stiff your tendon is, uh, and so forth. Um, globally, there's going to be some other things that are going to go into that as well, which is going to be, you know, how well can you absorb that training load? Um, and, and that's going to be things like stress and sleep and some of the things that maybe, you know, as recently as five years ago, we didn't have a lot of appreciation for, but I think now, from a running research standpoint, we're starting to have a, we're starting to really view these things like this, you know, how much stress you might have in your life as being pretty important. So that's on one side of the seesaw and the other side of the seesaw is going to be applied training loads. So that might be, um, you know, just basically how much you're running and the overall running training load. And there's a lot that goes into that training load and that may be how fast you're running, the running terrain that you're running on. Um, it may be how frequently you're running, of course, and also how far you're running. Um, and so when that total sum of applied loads exceeds the tissue quality or the tissue tolerance for that load, um, we've basically exceeded the load tolerance for that structure or for that runner, and then an injury, you know, might develop. And um, it's worth saying that these are not, none of these things are fixed. And so tissue quality or, or the the person's ability to tolerate training load fluctuates from day to day. Uh, again, you know, life stresses play a major role. How recovered you are from the day's the previous day's workout, um, those things can, can change too. And it also changes across the year based on our overall fitness levels. Uh, and so, you know, what, you know, basically when I, the way I kind of look at this is when someone develops an injury, how can we do two different things? We, first, we want to, um, reduce the overall load slightly in the person. Uh, so we can, you know, kind of reduce some of those abusive loads on the tendon or what have you. Um, so that, then we can build this person right back up 
and get them back to where they need to be and build that build that muscle up, build the tendon back up and so forth. And there are a lot of different ways that we could do that. Uh, I would certainly say strength and conditioning is is one of the one of the best ways. So progressive resistance exercises and things like plyometrics and things like that can play a, a, a super important role. Um, but you know, when, when we do that, I think that, you know, when, when we as clinicians are working with patients, I think historically, um, and I know I'm certainly guilty of this in the past that I've tended to, to underload patients. And when a patient comes in, they've got pain. I've tended to really reduce the amount of load. Um, I've, I've told them to kind of lay off running as much and, you know, and so forth. And, and more so, you know, now that we're starting to understand a lot more about, you know, tissue qualities and, 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 and how it responds uh, to rest uh, and so forth, we, we're starting to know that rest for a lot of these soft tissue injuries uh, in particular are, are, are really not a good idea. Um, stress fractures are different issue altogether of course i mean those that, that's a, that's a pretty complicated injury but when we're looking at soft tissue injuries or even something like patellofemoral pain um th- those are injuries that don't do very well with with absolute rest so we really want to try to keep um keep loading these individuals and if there's any way that we can kind of keep this person running um that's great absolutely and um so there are lots of different tricks that we as clinicians have that that can can help a runner uh continue running and and also if someone is having some pain and discomfort when they're doing their exercises uh you know it used to be thought that that was kind of a bad thing but you know i think that if we can work with a runner so they can kind of understand that that is not necessarily a bad thing and and ways that they can kind of apply more load to themselves and um you know i I think the better off the better off our runners are going to be so the seesaw, we want to overall as runners apply more load at all times because we're trying to run further, go faster. So we're, we're putting emphasis on that side. We're all pretty good at doing that. Um, however, Rich, you know, strength running uh, is one, if not the leading way to increase capacity or tissue tolerance or tissue quality as, as you termed it on the other side of the seesaw. So for a master's runner tuning in, what are the key things that they need to know around strength training, Rich? And, uh, you know, it can be a daunting prospect and, you know, many uh, pushbacks when it comes to the idea of incorporating that into a training week. So can you take us through why it's important? You've obviously already touched on the fact that we're trying to increase our capacity to deal with our running loads, but why is it important? How do we actually get started and start to integrate it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think for clinicians and, and runners alike, I think one of the, the best concepts that, people can get behind is that when we, there's a lot more about getting strong than just being strong. So just because someone is a strong individual doesn't necessarily mean that they won't benefit from strength training. And so, um, so much so that um, I would almost even say that strength training is probably not even really the best term. And the reason for that is when we, when we load tissues, um, there's this really neat process that is called mechanotherapy that, that occurs. And that's that um, when, you, when you load muscle, you know, it's, uh, you're going to get muscular hypertrophy. But when you load bone, um, you're going to get bone remodeling. When you load tendon, you're going to get collagen, collagen synthesis. Um, ligament, you're going to get collagen synthesis too. You load articular cartilage, you're going to get uh, the the quality of that articular cartilage is also going to improve, and so you know strength training is 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 such a great way to accomplish a lot of those things. And I and I know that you know a lot of runners may be thinking, well, I'll just well I'll just run. Um, but the interesting thing about running is that uh, while it's a really great activity for cardiovascular conditioning uh, and and so forth, it it seems to be too high of a repetition activity and the uh, to really generate the or stimulate the, the the nice changes in tendon quality and connective tissue qualities that we see with strength training and um, a large part of that is is that when you contract a muscle or you load a structure when you're running that structure is actually not loaded for very long at all it's a kind of a you know, your your muscle contracts and then it relaxes. Whereas when you strength train and you go into the gym and let's say you're doing you're doing a nice slow knee extension machine and you're doing or a knee extension exercise and you're on the knee extension machine and you're you're doing the you're raising the weight for three seconds and then you're lowering that weight back down for another three seconds, you've created a, an environment for that 
for that muscle, the quadriceps, and the quadriceps tendon, the patellar tendon, uh, your patella, which in your articular cartilage is associated with that, uh, and everything else in that area, and the bone that the, those tendons are connected to, where that those structures are under tension for six whole seconds, uh, and for and for six straight seconds, and and that's the kind of stimulus that our connective tissues seem to respond to the best so that's doing repetitions of exercises three seconds up three seconds down exactly yeah yeah and it's and if you think about that it's going to take you so many your, your foot's on the ground for about a quarter second when you're running of which your quadriceps you only really get to your peak quadriceps contraction for just a, a very very small portion of that 250 milliseconds so probably about 20 percent of that stance cycle so when you add up you're going to take it's going to take you a lot of foot strikes to get the same amount of total tension or total time under tension as you would from just doing one repetition on the knee extension machine so it's just a way more efficient um way to to load our extremities uh it seems that um you know our connective tissues really like that kind of loading uh, they respond really well to it um and uh, you know i think that when you're looking at the athlete who is trying to recover from a, a soft tissue injury uh in particular tendon injuries um there, there's no really no better way to do it than than kind of this idea of slowly loading these structures with with heavy weight and you referenced in episode 74 and if you've missed that one jump back and listen to that one where rich you know you took us through the concept of isolated exercises single leg it doesn't need to be fancy the you know the the dynamic you know clean and jerk type exercises these can be as simple as seated leg extension calf raise work you know hamstring curls uh rich in terms of getting into the gym uh we need to lift heavy as you've referenced but it's okay isn't it to start with a few weeks a month or thereabouts or longer with some slightly lesser lesser loads in terms of weight and, and greater reps initially what would you suggest there for the runner that has never set foot inside a gym yeah i think if you if you're new to weightlifting i think first and foremost i think you probably need to um get hooked up with a personal trainer uh, or someone who really knows their way around the gym um, who can help you out with learning how to lift properly and use the use the uh, the machines appropriately and so forth um, and if you have a, an old injury I think one that's particularly problematic like a um, you know kind of a like a persistent uh, lumbar some low back pain or something like that, that individual can really help you kind of design a strength training program or that will kind of maybe help that, but hopefully will at least not aggravate it. Um, but with that said, you know, I think if you're, if you're, if you're good to go and you're wanting to start on a strength training program, I think a, a good way to do it, uh, is to start off with, um, fairly high repetitions. Um, so we're talking like, you know, two sets of 15 repetitions, um, you know, a couple times a week. I think that's, you know, I think that's, that, that's a great way to do it. Um, because when, when you're doing that, you're, you're basically just going through the motion and you're, there's a lot of nice things that are still occurring and this should be a pretty easy, pretty easy 15 repetitions when you're doing that. Um, but once you get past that, that initial month, or so of doing that and this kind of this, this accommodation to that new uh, training program, just like anything, whether it be running or strength training, you want to start off kind of slow. Your goal should be to start getting down into fewer and fewer repetitions while you're increasing uh, the amount of weight that you're lifting. And, you know, ideally you kind of want to start getting yourself down to, um, you know, maybe start off in, in, you know, week one, two, and three at doing, uh, you know, 15 repetitions. And maybe by week four, you want to get start getting yourself down to, you know, around 10 repetitions with a with a higher weight and then after that you kind of really want to change gears you want to really start looking at getting down to you know maybe four sets of eight repetitions for the next couple of weeks uh and then uh down to three sets of of six repetitions and um you know with, with a, i'm sorry four sets of six repetitions with, with some higher weight uh e even more so and you know that that probably is, seems very counterintuitive because i think a, a lot of runners um and a lot of clinicians often prescribe you know like a high repetition strength training program, um, but when when you look at the when you look at the evidence, um, when you're unless you're getting down, unless you're lifting a weight that is um, you know difficult to lift 
for uh, at least for no more than 10 repetitions that you, you know you can do with that weight. If you're lifting weight that is higher than that or that is easier than that, you're getting higher reps than 10 repetitions. What happens is that it doesn't seem to be enough load to trigger some of the uh, desired changes that we like to see in connective tissue and tendon in particular. We don't see the increase in tendon stiffness. Uh, and when we're starting to lift with greater than 10 repetitions uh, per per set, um, you really only start to see those nice changes in tendon as we get um, as you know as we get a little bit you know lower repetitions. So six to eight repetitions is, is where it seems like the evidence is really pointing us toward. And uh, to the runner that would be concerned that they were going to bulk up, what would you say to, the, to the, the runner with that concern? Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't seem like that really kind of shakes out when you look at the literature. I mean, it, it seems like um, this this idea of um, of lower repetitions, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that makes us strong than us just adding on muscle bulk. Um, there's a lot of, there's a very neuro, there's a very strong, or not strong, but uh, very important neural component um, to strength. So um, how our muscle, how our nerves are recruiting muscle fibers and so forth is is uh, also a large part of, of, of how we gain strength. Um, but the other part of it too is if you're participating in regular endurance training at the same time uh, that you're doing uh, weight training, there, there seems to be a bit of an, uh, this interference effect um, that um, somewhat prevents us from, um, or you know, doesn't entirely prevent us from from gaining muscle mass, um, but it, it seems to kind of ward off a, a large part of that. And our overall body mass tends to tends to uh, stay about the same or, or even reduce with the strength training program. But you do get some some increase in, in localized um, muscle mass with strength training. It's not, of course, not as much if you're not also endurance running. Um, but those are changes that you want to see. I mean, those are things that are, that are really important. And, um, you know, I, I think when you look at elite athletes too, I mean, I think that's a really big change that you see in middle distance athletes and triathletes and, and so forth is that, you know, now it's like, it's just like a triathlete. They actually are, they do four sports, you know, and weight training is one of them. And, and I think two decades ago that they, that really wasn't the case at all. So, uh, there's a big important reason why these, uh, these elite athletes are doing the strength training. And that's because, um, that's because it really does improve performance. Um, but it also seems to reduce one's overall risk of developing an overuse injury. Yeah, great. And before we move off strength training, Rich, just a couple of really practical uh, questions. Recovery time between, you know, if, you, if you're in the gym, you're doing seated leg extensions, slow reps, three seconds up, three seconds down, over time, pushing, you know, solid, solid loads there. What's the recovery time? Is it okay just to do the right side and then go back to the left? Or do you specify a specific recovery time? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think generally... Um you know, you should be doing two to three minutes of rest. When you look at, uh, when you look at the literature, that's like, you know, where are we seeing the the, the greatest gains in muscle strength and uh, and so forth? It seems that um, two to three minutes of rest in between uh, each set is going to be ideal. And um, performing these exercises two to three times per week um, is also uh, is also ideal. I think when your training loads are very high, um, so like in the in the competitive season and so forth, I think a lot of athletes will drop down to doing more of a maintenance program of maybe maybe once per week. But um, when your overall running loads or running training loads are very are kind of on the low side, like in the off season or preseason, that's a good time to be hitting the gym three times per week. Um, for, for sure. And there was one other thing, there's a, you asked a question earlier, I kind of, I didn't quite get around to answering. And that was, should you be doing isolated joint exercises or should you be doing multi-joint exercises and, and so forth? I, I would say that they're, they're, they're both important, but understand that if you're on a single joint machine, like a knee extension machine, um, you're going to be able to load that quadricep and load that patellar tendon and load that articular cartilage with greater weight with the knee extension machine than if you're doing a single leg squat with weight. So if you're trying to do a what a lot of folks would consider to be a, a functional type exercise, doing a single leg squat, you're basically what you're doing is you're splitting that workload between your, your ankle, your knee, and your hip. And also on top of that, because you're doing it in a single leg, you're having to also work on your balance. And because you're also trying to maintain your balance, you're not going to be able to lift as much. And so being on a machine that 
just takes all that load and focuses it on one muscle group where you don't have to worry about falling over, you're going to be able to deliver a lot more resistance stimulus uh, to that joint and associated muscle uh, with, with greater efficiency on the, on the machine or the, the single joint exercise. Great. Rich, where should a master's runner incorporate their running around their gym sessions? So they've got the, you know, we've adopted the, the idea that we need to strength train uh, until death to us part, but where, where, where to fit it? Does it go, do we run after a gym training session or a resistance session? Do we have the day off after gym training? What would be your suggestions? Yeah. Um, Rich Blagrove, he, um, he's from the UK, has, has done some really neat work in, in this area and, and kind of synthesized a lot of literature. Um, and, and, you know, it seems like, you know, there are some, there's some ideal ways to do that, that you should have a couple hours in between your, your running session uh, before you strength train or vice versa. Um, so there's some, there's some ideal ways to do this uh, from a timing standpoint. Uh, generally, generally speaking, though, I think a lot of the runners that I end up working with, um, you know, they, they only get one crack at it. And so they maybe need to do strength training and then go for a run or whatever. So I think the emphasis should be like as far as timing throughout the day, uh, what's going to work the best for you. So for, for me, I mean, it, the last thing I want to do when I come back from a run is do some strength training. And so as a result, I'll, I'll do my strength training maybe before I go for a run. Um, now, with that said, the other thing to really keep in mind too is that when we're, when we're looking at across a week, you know, I think it's really important for runners to make sure that they're, even though we're getting a little bit older, um, or, you know, what have you, or maybe you're not even training for a race, it's still so important to maintain an easy, hard, easy, hard kind of cycle throughout the week. And strength training also has, it plays a really important uh, role in that too. So if you run hard on a, let's say you run easy on a Monday after your long run on a Sunday, and then you go to the track workout on a Tuesday, and then you, on Wednesday, um, you hit the gym and you left really heavy in the gym. Um, what's happened there is that then you've placed two hard days back to back. The Tuesday day was the track day and Wednesday was the heavy day in the gym. Um, and then let's say then on top of that, then you do a tempo run on Thursday or have you, then, you know, or maybe another, maybe a hill repeat. Then you've got three hard days in a row where you're basically – applying a um, like maximal or near maximal stimulus uh, to your musculature and to your connective tissues on, on a back to back to back kind of schedule and um, that doesn't make a lot of sense when we when we realize that we get stronger and our muscles get stronger and our tendons get stronger when we're resting and so when you look at the recommendations um, that uh, a lot of tendon experts are, are are currently making and so forth, and I would definitely adhere to this too. Is that you know, add, put your strength training on one of your hard days, so that your hard days are hard and your easy days are really easy. And what I mean by hard days, I mean that's maybe the day that you do your track workout. So you know, maybe that would ideally look like you're going to strength train in the morning and then do your track workout in the evening, or something like that. And, and maybe just from a practicality standpoint, those two. Uh, those two sessions need to be closer together, but then your next day should be super easy, just light jogging or something like that. So you give everybody uh, or all your structures, you know, this, this chance to recover from that, from that applied workload. And I mean, I've been thinking about this and implementing changes to my practice since you presented on this at the Latrobe running symposium. And, and even with, you know, masters runners or non-masters runners recovering from tendinopathies or, or bony injuries uh, i've compounded their running with their their resistance days together and in many cases giving them a complete rest day the next day or something very light uh and easy if, if they need to be out there and uh i, I think overall it's probably made a, a positive change in some of those runners outcomes that are rehabilitating injuries oh that's awesome yeah no i for me the same thing i you know i think about um you know, where, where I really kind of started uh, latching onto this was uh, when I, I started looking at how I was doing my return to run programs with a, with a runner who was injured. And I'd have this runner who, who maybe uh, had a, you know, Achilles tendinopathy or something like that, enough that it really took them out of running for a while. And then I was having them, you know, return to running. A lot of those are going to be walk run programs where they're maybe doing a walk run session on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And, you know, even though the overall workload is, is low 
uh, it's actually relatively high for that individual at that given point. And so they're you're, they're really stressing themselves. But what I was, I was making the mistake of then doing their strength training, because I still want them to be doing resistance training exercises as they continue throughout their pro, their their progression and you know so forth. I want them to continue doing the strength training even once they're done with me. They would, I was having to do their strength training on the non-running days. And I just felt like when I made that change, like what, what you just described to add the strength training on the same day that they were doing the running on these return to run programs, it made a world of difference for the runner uh, as far as their ability to tolerate and try to get back to uh, they're they're running in a relatively seamless manner. And the role of walking, uh, Rich, uh, that can be quite underestimated, but quite useful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I, you know, so I think that runners, they, they really like to run. And huh. I, I think running, runners, they, you know, they, they, they I, have, I think that a lot of runners I know have a tendency to undervalue uh, the importance of walking. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the knee joint load, the, the amount of like the cumulative load that's being applied to like the patellofemoral joint uh, or your tibial femoral joint when you're when you're walking over a given distance, the, the cumulative load is really not a whole lot different than running. Mm. So let's say you're a runner who 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 is injured and you you can't tolerate um, you can't tolerate running, um, but you know the, the most important thing for you probably to do is keep active, keep moving, keep walking, and and I highly recommend using a step counter. Um, and think about running not so much when you're recovering from an injury as like you know how far you've run from a distance standpoint or how long you've run from a, a minute or a duration standpoint. But think about it more in a load cycle. Like how and load cycles mean steps. How many steps are you taking? And so when you look at the average return to run program that's out there and ours being one of them, um, on day one of that return to run program, uh, you know, they're 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 doing one minute of walking and three minutes of running or some version of that. And they're doing like say six or six or seven repetitions of that. So it doesn't sound like a lot because they're only really running for seven or eight minutes total over the course of a 30 minute session. Yeah. But when you add up the number, when you add up the number of steps they take, it ends up being about four thousand. So if that runner has been doing nothing but kind of getting through getting through their days and maybe getting four thousand steps in, and then suddenly they start doing this return to run program, they've just doubled the number of loading cycles on their lower extremities when they on day one of that return to run program. So really, running is 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 great, but man, walking is the foundation and the basis for, for really all of our movement patterns. And as you say, runners, we like to run. So, uh, so therefore that when the partner wants to go for a walk, uh, it might not be such a bad thing after all. (laughs) No, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah. It's, yeah, I think it's great. And you know, one of the places too, like, you know, living in Missoula where I live in the mountains and that's one of the things I've really learned to appreciate is that, you know, there, there are a lot of runs I I go on where I gotta, I gotta do some walking and because it's just the inclines are so much. And you know, when, as a runner, you think, "Gosh, I can't, I can't stop running. I got to keep running up this, up this hill." But the reality is, is that walking is just as fast on some of the on some of the trails that I, I run on. And there's really no shame in, in walking. In fact, if you look at some of the fastest trail runners in my area, um, they spend a lot of time getting really good at walking. You're listening to Dr. Rich Willie on this, an expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, sharing around all things the Masters Runner. If you missed last week's episode, episode 131 of the Physical Performance Show, featuring five times, that's right, five times Australian Winter Olympian and 2010 Olympic aerial skiing champion Lydia Lasilla, then here's a little bit of Lydia's sharing around her highs, lows, and learnings. I think that period of, you know, being really injured was definitely my low, being this up and down cycle of injury, um, knowing that I could be better, but having this kind of excuse as physical injury um, being there, and that was really frustrating period for me, knowing that I could be better, but I was always injured. To tune into the full episode, featuring Lydia Lasilla, then jump over to iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from and check out the full episode. And while you're there, why don't you take a look around the archives and enjoy some of the other episodes. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Rich Willie on this an expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, sharing around all things the Masters Runner. Rich, uh, the fight against the reduction in calf musculature strength and propulsion, you've cited before that 50% of 
our propulsion tends to come from below the knee. So we're trying to combat that as we mature as runners. Just very practically in the gym environment, what would be your go-to exercises there? And is there any benefit if just for whatever reason, Rich, someone's on the road, they can't get to a gym, what would you suggest they could be doing at home to help their calves? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, I think just to reiterate that point, the calf musculature is, is so important to the older runner. And it's, it's really important for all runners because it, it really contributes about 50% of our total support moment uh, when you compare it to the knee and your, um, your uh, hip musculature. But the really, if you, were, if you were to ask me, like, what's the one exercise that the master's runner should do, it would be a, a single leg calf raise. Uh, where maybe they're they're holding on to, to like a door frame for balance um, and and doing some doing some heavy weight so holding a big dumbbell or if you're on the road just throw some weight into a backpack and do some single leg calf raises try to make sure that you know if you're if you haven't done it before that you're starting off with 15 repetitions a couple sets but once you're able to tolerate look at having enough weight in that backpack that it's a struggle for you to get more than eight repetitions per set and then you're doing three to four sets of that a couple times a week yeah great so there is some utility and if you're not in the gym you can still do something to help at home yeah absolutely i I don't even belong to a gym i've got um i've got some adjustable weights at home and some dumbbells um that i use and i I feel like i can kind of get it done there i don't think you need anything really special and um you can go to um, you know, like a, a secondhand store or like a garage sale or something like that and, 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 and pick up a pair of dumbbells pretty cheap. And that's that's going to be really all that you're going to need. And uh, in terms of isolating things like quadriceps, and can you can you achieve that well at home or is that where you really do need to get into the, the gym, into a leg extension, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's going to be a little bit tougher, um, you know, to do for sure. I think, um, yeah, the knee extension machine is really, really the best way to do it. Um, but you know, you, you still can really load your quadriceps. You can really kind of target them, um, you know, well by doing like a step down uh, exercise. So if you if you've got a step and you're and you're stepping down, you're you're using your other, you're coming down with your other leg and you're just kind of tapping your heel on the ground and then bringing yourself back up while you're holding on to a weight. Um, that's going to be it's going to really load your quadriceps um, in, in a very high manner and it, and it doesn't use your hip extensors very much as long as you keep your trunk upright. If you start to lean forward, that's going to start engaging your your hip extensors a little bit more. Um, but doing that single leg step down is a is a great way at home uh, to really load your quadriceps. You're you're going to get some some calf uh, contributions there too. But um, and and yeah, it's not it's not as good as being on on a knee extension machine for sure. But it, it's certainly a good way to get it done. And something and with the calves, important to incorporate straight leg work and bent leg work, right, Rich, to target the deeper part, the soleus, which is often the forgotten uh, cousin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you think about your gastrocnemius uh, musculature, and and you know they're kind of the nice, kind of sexy looking calf muscles. But the reality of it is, is that your the the soleus that's underneath it really represents about um, about sixty eight seventy percent of the total um, muscle mass of the calf musculature. And so you've got this you know giant muscle down there that we often don't think about and because it doesn't cross um, your knee joint the best way to isolate that muscle is to do calf raises with a bent knee and so it it seems like if you can bend your knee about 60 degrees or so or more you're really going to be able to isolate so like a a seated calf machine or seated uh, uh, soleus machine at the gym is is really the best way to get it done Uh, at home you can do it a a little bit uh, you can kind of you do that single leg calf raise with a bent knee, you're still going to get some gastrocnemius contributions there because you can't bend your knee to 60 degrees typically when you're doing a single leg heel raise. Um, but if you bend your knee some, you're really going to, you are going to shift more and more load over to that soleus muscle. And, that, and that's really what you want to kind of focus on. Yeah. Don't, don't forget the bent knee version. Rich, uh, just want to ask you around the masters runners. I, I, I observe a real proclivity in many runners to, to gravitate towards you know, such a big area, shoes that are maximalist design, you know, your Hoka Erne Ones or, you know, the, the more recent additions to the running shoe marketplace. Uh, this is something that I know you, you pay great attention to in your research. So, you know, is there any merit in a master's runner going and picking up one of these maximalist shoes as opposed to a more traditional type shoe? Yeah. So when, when you talk about shoes, I guess we can kind of divide them up into three different types of shoes. You got your kind of your standard running shoe that you're going to see in a running shoe store. And then you have your minimal shoe, which is just like it sounds in your maximal shoe, which is going to have a lot more cushioning to it and so forth. There's, 
there's more difference between the standard shoe and the minimal shoe than there is in the standard shoe and these these Hoka shoes or these other these Max whatever Max most kind of shoe you're looking at. So there's not as much difference there. So for the runner to make that transition to running uh, into a in a Maximo shoe is not going to be as much of a change for them. A lot of older runners that I work with really. Um, kind of swear by these maximalist shoes. And um, so and I, I don't think we really understand yet how they change loading on the lower extremity. Um, but I do know that a lot of older runners, they tend to lose, um, they get some, uh, the fat pad that's on your heel it tends to atrophy a little bit as we get older. Uh, and also you know, the cushioning that you have on the bottom of your foot, the, the fat cushioning you have down there tends to also reduce a little bit too. So a lot of these runners really like these Hoka shoes because they, they tend to kind of reduce some of the loading that's right on the planter surface. Um, and, and if that's going to keep that person running, I, I don't, for me, I, I don't have a big problem with that. Um, we're, where I think like maybe you can go a little bit wrong is if you're an older runner and you're in a running in a standard shoe and then you decide to run in a minimalist shoe, you, you have to be ready for the change in the calf loads that are going to occur. And I think that's a much bigger jump for the older runner to make uh, than to run from, move from a standard shoe to uh, to these, one of these maximalist or highly cushioned shoes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the take home point for footwear selection for the masters runners is just be cautious if you're going towards a minimalist, otherwise you're pretty safe. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I think, I think a good way to look at it is like, you know, I was like an early adopter of the Nike free when it first came out about the Nike free 3.0 and, um, way back, I think it was in like 2005 when they first came out and, and it, it, it came with an instruction manual, you know, and the instruction manual told me like how to ease into the shoe and it had a, a nice schedule and all that stuff that I think was like eight or 10 weeks long on how to ease into running into the shoe. And, and you still, you still see that in some of these minimal shoes, they'll, they'll give you guidelines on how to do that. But when you buy like a maximally cushioned shoe, they don't come with a the sort of instruction manual. And, and there's a reason for that. And that's, I think that runners aren't getting themselves in trouble on these types of shoes. Yeah, so interesting. Rich, uh, we're approaching uh, the end of our time today, but I think, uh, let me let me ask you this. What, what would you say if you had to boil everything down, which is impractical and impossible, but I'm still going to throw it to you, to one piece of advice, if you could only give one piece to the master's runner, what would it be to help them stay out there enjoying their running injury-free, performing at their best? Oh, one piece. Um, that's a good question. I would say strength train. Yeah, absolutely. Resistance train, um, for sure. And, and, and get in the gym and do it regularly. I think the overall health benefits um, go extend far beyond running. And I think those things are, are hard to deny. But the fact that strength training also um, will in, in head off some of the the muscular changes that we see with aging uh, and so forth, I think are, it's, it's just, you, you need to do it. I, I think for sure. Um, if I can get one other piece of advice that I would give, <laughs> of course, uh, I would say with your running, avoid running the same pace every day. And if you can, um, you know, ease into it, of course, be very slowly, but still, even if you're not targeting a race, pick one day a week to make a pretty intense session where you're doing some speed work or you're doing some hill repeats, something that's going to challenge from a running standpoint, challenge your plantar flexors when you're running outside of the weight room. And so something on top of that, I think those two things, and I know I'm kind of cheating by giving two things, but I think those two things are going to be the most important things that you can do. So mixing it up and adding intensity is really, really critical for helping to reduce some of that age-related decline in, in strength and stiffness of the tendons, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and a collaborator of mine, Max Paquette at um, University of Memphis has done some really neat work with this. And he, he finds that runners who, who tend to run a little more uh, with a little more intensity, they, te- they, they, they tend not to demonstrate some of these same declines that we see in step length and uh, reduced ankle power during running. So that's, that's a hard thing for me to, to say that that's not important. So I think, yeah, maintaining some intensity uh, on, a, on an occasional basis once a week at least I think is a good way to do it. Which is great because it can be a real aversion you know, for the master's runner towards speed and getting stuck in that, that middle cruisy pace, I guess, which is re- relative for all of us. Uh, and uh, I've even heard you reference mixing up your, your running routes. Don't run the same 
route all the time, which at the moment I'm guilty of. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Me too. I mean, when I've got the time is tight, I, I tend to jump into a run that I know ex- exactly to the minute how long it's going to take. <laughs> to so yeah, for sure. No, fantastic. Rich, uh, we didn't ask, I didn't ask you, sorry, uh, back on episode 74, the personality question and, uh, expert editions. Uh, everyone likes to know a little bit about the personality behind the expert. Three people at a dinner table for Rich Willie, living or past, who would be at your table and why Rich? Oh, well, yeah, this is, I guess the, the low hanging fruit would be Bernard Lagat. And I, I know you had him on your show a while ago, but I, I think he's just a fascinating athlete. He's a, he's a master's track runner and, and, you know, how he's been able to kind of keep it together, I think is, and still remain at, at just the, the top of his game is, is amazing. Um, I'm a, cyclist from you know at heart so greg lamond i think is is a childhood hero of mine so i think uh sitting down with greg lamond would be pretty cool too uh and then peter cavanaugh uh he is the i guess the grandfather of running biomechanical research and um you know my phd advisor irene davis actually got her phd under peter cavanaugh but um i'd love to sit down and, and chat with them at some point so yeah those would be uh the 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 three individuals for sure well, it's a fascinating table, and uh, we had Bernard Legat on only a few episodes after your last appearance on the show, Rich, with your expert edition. And one of the things I loved about Bernard's approach was, as you, you know, your reference is, is such an inspiration for so many with what can be achieved with running across the lifespan. But he he just refused, he said, to to ever contemplate the idea that any of his performance was due to his age, that he's old. He just doesn't have any his vocabulary. I think there's so much to take from that in terms of a mindset and a perspective around our activity levels as we mature, all of us. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think there's a chicken or the egg thing. You know, do we, do we start running like an old person because we have to or, or vice versa, you know? So, yeah, I think, I think he's a real inspiration for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. Rich, uh, finally, uh, the physical challenge for the week. Let's make this specific for the Masters runner. So what's Dr. Rich Willie's physical challenge to the Masters runner for the week going to be? Go to the gym and start doing some calf raises. Awesome. Rich, thank you for your time. It's evening time there in the town of uh, the University of Montana or Missoula. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, there is so much more. I think we might have to make you an annual fixture on the Physical Performance Show as an expert. Oh, thanks, Brad. No, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed being on the show. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I'm sure you took a lot out of Dr. Rich Willie sharing around his area of expertise, and that is all things running research as they translate to helping runners enjoy injury-free and faster running. If you did enjoy Rich's share-ins, then do two things. One, if you're yet to jump back and listen to episode 74, where Rich first appeared on the Physical Performance Show, then do so. On that episode, Rich talks in more detail around strength training, running shoe selection, and how it relates to injury minimization and performance, structuring run training programs, running wearables, gait retraining, and so much more. The second thing is drop Rich a message. Rich is home on social media, is over on Twitter, and you'll find Rich's handle at rwilly2003. So that's R-W-I-L-L-Y, numerics 2003, at rwilly2003. So jump over and let Rich know what it was on Twitter that you took away from this episode of the Physical Performance Show, the Expert Edition. Now, I said at the top of the show that we would give away the two prizes for the On Running Shoes, generously sponsored by On Running over on episode 130, which featured great British triathlon great Tim Don. And a drum roll, the winners of an On Running pair of shoes are Nicole Sidden. And over on Instagram, Nicole's handle is at Sporty Mum Nick, N I C, all one word, lowercase. And Nicole commented, I listened to this great physical performance show episode featuring the inspirational Tim Don on my run today, the man in a halo. Making a comeback after a broken neck is an incredible story of guts, determination, and pain tolerance. I'm in the process of coming back to running after head and neck cancer, and I would just love a pair of on running shoes as they are very cool. Definitely will get me a lot of attention on the Canberra trails. So Nicole, I hope you enjoy your on running shoes. I know you will, and thank you for your support 
of the Physical Performance Show and entering the giveaway from episode 130. And the second lucky winner of the On Running Shoes giveaway is Fabian Rabazzo. Fabian, well done, congratulations, and also Nicole. Now, talking about giveaways, today's show supporter, Physiocram, is also giving away an awesome Physiocram prize pack. To see it, you can jump over the show notes or over to the at Physical Performance Show Instagram gallery. And there you'll see the prize pack for this awesome giveaway. Now, to go into the draw for the Physio Krem prize pack, which will be drawn in a few episodes' time, jump over to the URL of the at Physical Performance Show Instagram page and leave your name and details to go into the draw. A big thanks to the team that make the Physical Performance Show possible each and every week, and that is Daryl Misson, our audio engineer. Susan Wilkin, All Things Administration, and Matthew Olding, All Things Graphic Design. Thank you to you for listening, rating, and reviewing over on iTunes, and also subscribing. That helps the Physical Performance Show get into more earbuds of people who, just like yourself, are looking to pursue and perform at their physical best. Coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we jump back to a featured performer and I bring you a conversation that I had with Australian Olympic swimmer, dual Olympian David McKeon. David shares around the highs, the lows and the learnings of his swimming career to date, including how he is managing and coping with shoulder rehabilitation following recent shoulder surgery after the 2018 Commonwealth Games. It's a really insightful interview into an Australian who is doing fantastic things on the international swimming scene, and he's such a great guy to go with it as well. So I know you're going to really enjoy David McKeon next week on the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.